Okay, well, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance if this all goes terribly wrong. Uh, this is, uh, I underestimated the difficulty that would be involved in having uh, streaming from the garage where I have the, uh, the CNC router and from the, this computer at the same time. Uh, so, uh, what we're going to be doing today uh, is we're going to make a shaper with a uh, uh, a uh, the CNC router I just got, uh, and by just got I mean a few months ago. Um, so for those of you who may not know, a shaper is just a tool that we use in uh, uh, Double Read World to make reads. Uh, we take a there's this it's kind of like a metal stencil and we take uh, our piece of cane and we sandwich it in between those. Now these are actually pretty expensive because they're custom tooling. Um, are there... There's a lot of machining involved and they don't sell many of these. So they get pretty expensive. Uh, but in my... Since I've gotten the CNC router, I've abused it in various ways, making things that it has no business making. Um, I mean, one thing it actually is designed for, if you look behind me, you can see I have a, I now have a sub bassoon stand, which is essentially three shelves um, that I, and I routed the, uh, the profile that holds the instrument on the uh, on the shape oko. Uh, the the main reason I got it though is to make key work, uh, subcontrabassoon key work out of. Um, and uh, that uh, there's a uh, there's a video. I'm gonna have a whole video on that. But I figured let's take it one step further and actually make a shaper. So I'm gonna be making these out of aluminum. And I'm going to be starting with this. So this is two pieces of aluminum. And I, you can already see I've gone in with the Shape Oko and machined this arc and a matching arc on the other side. This way, the cane is held in between the two arcs. But, um, but right now it's just a square and I need to turn it into a, um, the, the shape of the reed. And I actually have already done a few of these. So this is my, uh, soprano crumb horn shaper I made last night. Now these are actually going to be a little bit different. Uh, so you can see it clamps, there's these little alignment pins that are in the middle and there's springs uh, to, to make it easier to put cane in. And here is my tenor crumb horn shaper. And I've actually already made a sub bassoon shaper. Uh, that's in a different room though, so I'll have to get that in a little bit. Uh, but let's go ahead and get get the process started, and then while it's machining, I can um, talk a little bit about the, the process. So, I'm going to run to the garage, taking this, uh, this shaper blank, and if you look here, you'll see this is the, the setup that I have going on. I have a, uh, a plate. Uh, that I'm going to be mounting these uh, plates to. I also need to indicate it uh, so that I know that it's in the, the exact correct position. Um, and I'm going to go start doing that now.
Uh, this is an audio test. I really hope you all can hear me right now. All right. One of the most important tool, safety glasses. Got those on. So, before I get started, like I said, I need to indicate everything in. So I'm going to replace this the bit that's in there now with just a piece of 1 8 hardened shaft. So now I'm going to make sure that everything's zeroed in and that this hole right here is where I want it to be. down okay so that looks right so now I have this pin here it's gonna go in that hole and we have oh hold on I forgot the there are two pins they go in the shaper itself and these register the two pieces together like that now the other way. Got that. Actually, hold on, I forgot one more thing. Need to. I just needed to clean that hole so it doesn't get stuck. Oh, here we go. And I should say that this plate, I've uh, after I installed it, I machine leveled it. So I actually used the cutter itself to surface it. That's the, the best way I can think of to get this surface as parallel to the uh, the cutter axes as possible. Okay. So right now, so these these screws don't hold it. They're designed to put clamping pressure downwards. They don't uh, hold it in place or they don't align it in place what I do for that is I use this hardened this hardened shaft again and I'm going to bring that over here exactly where I want this hole to be and then use that to align everything okay so g0 x negative 106 y negative 5 okay Okay. 
So now that I have these two points exactly where I want them, I tighten the clamp screws. Okay, so now I know that this is at least within the, the limitations of the machine about as accurately positioned as possible. Okay. So now I don't need this shaft anymore. And I'm going to switch to the cutter. So this is a one quarter inch flat end mill. Uh, this isn't, there's no fancy coating on this. This is just carbide. Um, I usually like to use the, uh, the coated end mills, but I don't have a coated one quarter inch. There we go. So now my X and my Y are set. I just need to set the Z. And I'm gonna do that in a very low tech way with just a piece of paper. paper doesn't move and then take it down a little bit more to make up for the thickness of the paper Okay, so now I have my X, my Y, and my Z axes all set the way I want. Uh, there's one more thing I need to do uh, before I get started. I need to double check something. Uh, so I'm going to run back to the, the other room. Okay, uh, real quick while I'm here, can someone verify that you could actually hear anything I was saying in there? Okay, I think Ratchet said that he could, or they could hear. Okay, so real quick, I just wanna, just for my own comfort, I wanna verify that this so I'm going to be making a alto crumb horn shaper today so alto crumb horn and I just want to verify real quick that it's starting at the correct Z height uh, I don't want that first cut to be overly deep uh, I had when I was making these these blanks, some of them ended up um, a little askew, so I ended up needing to redo them. So some of these are a little bit thicker than the other. So let's, there we go. 
So the blank that I wanted to use for the alto crumb horn shaper is 19 millimeters tall. Make sure that the Z height is what it's supposed to be. Oh, I hope you didn't just crash. Oh wow, it, my computer really does not like opening Fusion 360 when I'm streaming. Yeah, so um, just to reiterate, the Shaper is just a tool that we use to make uh, double reads. And specifically, I'm going to be making a flat shaper. Okay. Sorry about this. Like I said, that's a uh, uh, this is a complicated streaming setup. Okay, let's try that again. Sorry, I meant to I meant to ha take care of this before, but I had a, a lot of technical challenges trying to get the streaming setup running. I was hoping I could use NDI uh, to to run to stream over my home network, uh, but that ended up not working out. So I'm having to stream to a private YouTube. Uh, stream two instances okay. from two different computers and then str streaming a YouTube stream it, it's all it's all sorts of messed up okay shaper Okay, got that. Let's close that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the garage.
Okay. So everything should be set up and ready to go. I just need to get the new Okay. So I need I want to set this at about 12,000 rpm. So slow that down a little bit from what it was. So I'm going to stay in here while it gets started to make sure that everything if you if something goes terribly wrong, it will happen right at the very beginning. Uh, if the the zero isn't set right, if um, well Long story short, a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, I'm also going to turn down the volume real quick because it's about to get terrible. Getting, we're getting going. Uh, so this is going to take about 40 minutes. Okay, so uh, here I told you all that I had made a sub shaper, so here it is, and you can see that on this one I've already cut off the end. Right now, you see there's the, the, the shapers have these um, kind of blocky parts on the end. This is actually just uh, for work holding purposes. Um, and alignment purposes, for the finished product, I'm going to cut these off. And you can actually see there's a... I've stored a little line here. Uh, but the subconscious shaper has already had that. Oh, Xander, is it too... Is uh, is it too loud? I can turn that down. Let me know if that's better. I turned the volume way down. I can mute the volume entirely. So, the reason... Honestly... Crumhorn shapers are a little bit extravagant, um, but the main reason I, I'm making, I went ahead and decided to make a full set of crumhorn shapers, um, 
is I need to, so right now this is just uh, 6061 aluminum, uh, pretty soft, something like an X-Acto blade could cut it pretty easily. Uh, let's see if I can demonstrate that. Yeah, so you can, it, it's taken off just a little, some little tiny slivers. Um, now, obviously, for a shaper, that's not really going to work because you're going to be constantly cutting along the side of it with an X-Acto blade. So, um, what I need to do is have these uh, adeni uh, anodized. Sorry, I always mess up that word. Uh, so get these anodized. The problem is most places have like a, a $100 minimum. You know, they're, they're not going to let you just bring uh, four pieces and anodize it for three bucks. There's going to be like a $100 minimum. So in order to maximize my value, I wanted to make the other, sh make other shapers that I might potentially, that might potentially be useful and uh, get all of them anodized at the same time. So right now I have my soprano crumb horn, my tenor crumb horn, my subcontra bassoon. Uh, over here we have our, my alto crumb horn is in progress. Then we have the slightly bigger bass crumb horn. So bass crumb horn reads you need to, uh, it's really better to make with um, uh, contra bassoon cane rather than bassoon cane. So the, the other crumb horn shapers are designed for a 120 millimeter bassoon cane. I usually gouge it a little thicker, but otherwise it's bassoon cane. Uh, for the base, you see it's quite a bit bigger, both wider and longer. And finally, figured why not, I'm gonna make a specialty Sopranino crumb horn uh, uh, shaper. Uh, the only difference between this and the Soprano is, so my Soprano um, is, not from, is not from the same set as my Alto. So it has a, um, so the Soprano uses an oddly large staple for the uh, the size of the instrument. So what I'm going to do is, uh, so I've modified the Soprano crumb horn shape to uh, to fit on a um, a smaller staple um, uh, that that'll I think will better match the other the other instruments. Uh, but that's going to be the only difference between the Sopranino and the Soprano, crumb horn shaper. Okay, so we have a little bit of time, and by little bit I mean, you know, like an hour. Uh, so if you have any questions, now would be a great time. Or I can, you know, just turn the volume on the, the angry machine all the way up and you all can listen to that. Uh, actually, oh. There is one thing, um, just maybe maybe to get a better idea of what's going on. And I'm gonna apologize in advance if this is, if my computer starts freaking out, I'm gonna try to open Fusion 360 and so we can see a, um, a representation of what's going on during the machining process. So, uh, Jared asked if I plan on selling custom shapers. Uh, 
I this is not this that would not be a business venture for the lighthearted. Um these are not a trivial amount of work. Um and to be honest with the I mean just just to be clear a shapeoko is not designed to mill three quarters of aluminum um nor is it designed to to mill all the nickels pretty much i bought this machine exactly for stuff it's not supposed to do um so i'm not entirely sure that these are going to be good enough that I could that I would feel comfortable selling them I need to get them anodized I need to see how they hold up you know over several uses um, it's not impossible that I would you know sell custom shapes uh, but that's not currently part of my business plan okay so, uh, oh, that's, that's not what you all want to see, or that's not what I want you all to see, I guess would be more accurate. Okay. So, uh, this is, uh, this is the alto crumb horn shape that I'm, uh, we're cutting out right now. And let's take a little bit closer look at what's going on. So right now, this is this is actually not a terribly complicated process. I just have two processes. Uh, the main one, what it's working on right now, is it's going to come through. Here, let me simulate that. No, nope, that's wrong. Besides, as you can see up here, if I start selling these, uh, I'd have to pay for Fusion 360. Okay. So, hide the bodies, hide the toolpath, show the stock. Okay. So this is what's happening right now. It's piece by piece. Uh, it's going down half a millimeter at a time and taking off one millimeter uh, side to side. And it's just going to keep doing that all the way down this cutter is just barely long enough to reach to the reach to the bottom of the piece without uh, crashing. But I've it's going to be a little bit oversized. So I have a second process on here that. Now, it's only going down half a millimeter at a time because the rigidity on a desktop machine is limited. You can't just take off a, a full 20 millimeters at once. Or you can't take a large cut, I should say. So what I've done is I'm using this first process to take off most of the stock. And then I'm going in a second time and just taking off a 40th of a millimeter at a time on the side, but cutting the, the whole height at once. Um, this is to help get rid of any step down lines on the, the finished profile. And the only reason I'm using four, a 40th millimeter at a time is because that's the resolution of the shape Oko. It has um, uh, uh, one 40th millimeter steppers. I'll 
close that. Where is okay? So in you, uh, well, you can't really see very well, but the finish. This is this is fresh from the machine. I haven't done any post processing on this yet, um, and the finish actually looks pretty good. And that's with doing the full cut along the edge. After, after I've cut off most, removed most of the stock, and once again, just taking a tiny skim cut at a time. Let's see what we have. Uh, Jared, I, I thought Fusion 360, you had to pay for it once you have a thousand dollars in gross earnings but uh i i'm not an expert at it so zachary says i can probably model new Cerus phone shapers with this uh yes i'd kind of be operating in the dark though and i'll be honest the um the I'm I'm fairly happy with the Cerus phone read I was able to make with uh, simply a contraforte with contraforte cane. Um, so yes, that's a possibility, but um, I'm not sure that it's high on my pro priority list. The crumb horns were such a pain to make reads for because they have completely alien shapes, especially the soprano and the alto. Yeah, so uh, just to clear up any confusion, the there is there was a historical instrument called the sub contra bassoon, or the sub contra fagot, uh, in German. Um, but it was the range of a normal contra bassoon. So any references you see to these these mythological beasts from the eighteen seventies. Uh, they're talking about essentially a metal contrabassoon uh, with a range to low A, like normal contrabassoon low A. And over the years, that kind of got misconstrued as, well, I mean, they named it the sub contrabassoon, not because it was an octave lower than the contrabassoon, but because it was a perfect fourth lower than the E flat metal, or the metal contrabassoon in E flat. That they were making what we would now know of or what we would now call a reed contrabass they made a slightly larger reed contrabass but since they called their reed contrabass a metal contrabassoon then the 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 version in b flat that went down to low a became the uh sub contrabassoon so this is through all the research I've been able to discover, this will be the very first sub bassoon ever made. Meaning, the very first instrument an octave below the contrabassoon ever made. If anyone has any evidence to, uh, uh, to, that would uh, question that, please send it to me because it would be important for me to know. Uh, but my understanding is that it was kind of, so uh, Mason asked, uh, you know, why it took so long to, to make a subcontra soon. Well, I think a lot of the problem was people thought it had already been done. People thought that someone made a subcontra soon back in the 1870s and it failed. So why would we do it again? It already, we already know that it doesn't work. Um, when they weren't talking about a subcontra, uh, what we would think of as a subcontra soon, they were talking about, a metal contrabassoon and it failed because the reed contrabass never really caught on in the orchestra. It wasn't the depth, it wasn't a 32 foot instrument that failed, it was a really loud 16 foot metal contrabassoon that failed. So I think that has a lot to do with why contra contrabassoons haven't been made, but 
It's also, I mean, it's admittedly extreme and it's complicated to make, which is why it's taken me so long and I'm still not done. So, uh, while, while we're waiting on this to finish, I'm gonna go get something to show you all. Okay, so this right here, in these two containers, this is most of the subcontrabassoon keywork that I have already made with the Shape Oko. So, for example, here we have our a E F sharp trill key. And all of this is organized by key. So starting with the octave keys over in the top left, working our way down to the A flat key in the bottom right. And then on the second one, we have from the low F key down to the low A key. Yes, Xander, I agree. Hopefully this subcontrabassoon will not be the last, but once again, as I've said several times, I view this as a science project. So if all we learn is that um, there's a reason an instrument an octave below the contrabassoon was never made, then we've still learned something because no one's ever made one before. Here is a particularly complicated little key. This is the uh, this is the low C sharp key uh, key touch arm. So yeah, here we go. So the the key touch is going to go here, and then this is going to uh, to activate the other part of the, the low C sharp key over on the on uh, the the bass joint because the low C sharp key itself is on the wing joint but the pad is on the bass joint and once again I have a, a video that's going to go more in depth on uh, the key work because it's pretty interesting now once again, abusing the shape Oko, um, it's kind of advertised as to cut um, thin aluminum, but for uh, woodwind key work, you really need nickel silver, which is, so aluminum, brass is harder to cut than aluminum, and nickel silver is harder to cut than brass. So... Buying the Shape Oko was pretty stressful because until I did my first cuts, I honestly didn't know if it was going to work. This is this is uh, a linkage for the uh, the, the low um, uh, the the low G key. So we have this weird little bend in here. This was a uh, I cut this as a flat piece and then uh, bent it. But there's other pieces here. So like here, this is a pad arm for the low or for the uh, upper octave key. I actually uh, milled a V groove in the middle of this and then use that V groove to to bend it into place and it worked pretty well. Okay, so uh, Scribbly says good morning. Good morning. It's not morning here, but good morning wherever you are that it is morning. 
Uh, let's see. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead and take maybe a little closer look at the uh, the process itself or the machining process. Okay, so I'm going to close that. So I'm going to open this up. Oh, that's actually wrong. It's supposed to be 12,000 RPM. Uh, but the, uh, so one thing about the Shape Oco is the, the router spindle itself is not controlled by, with the CNC. Uh, what this, what a Shape Oco is, is a, a um, an X, Y, and Z axis that runs a, a stock router. This is just a um, Makita router from, uh, I bought this at Home Depot. Um, uh, so the, the speed of the router itself is not run through CNC. So right here, I had the wrong speed, but because it doesn't actually control anything, um, it, it didn't cause a problem. So, so I have, um, let's, you, you all don't need to see all that. Um, so for this purpose, oh, actually here real quick. I know this is a little disjointed. So what's happening right now, you see there's that big, that big piece that's coming off. This is where it's actually getting through the, from one half to the other half. So that's why there's that, that piece there. Ooh, uh, hold on. I'm gonna watch this for a minute, make sure nothing gets, Okay, I think it's going to be okay. Okay, so uh, speeds and feeds that I'm using for aluminum on a one quarter inch uncoated end mill. Um, uh, once again, 12,000 RPMs, uh, 1200 millimeters per minute cutting feed rate. Now with the, the tool paths I've used, the lead-ins, there are no lead-ins or ramps that are, uh, it's always uh, coming in from outside the stock rather than plunging into the stock. So these speeds here don't really matter uh, for this particular tool path. And likewise, the plunge feed rate, this 600 millimeters, that's crazy. Uh, the only reason I'm using such a high plunge feed rate is because um, it's never plunging into the material. It's plunging into air. So I can use 600 millimeters per minute. Uh, on this desktop machine, if I were actually plunging into material, I'd be using something like 150 millimeters per minute, uh, something much smaller. All right. So the way that I'm doing this is I'm doing, um, so I have a, several of these options selected. Uh, roughing passes, I have a one millimeter step over on roughing passes. That means that coming in from the side, it's never going to remove more than one millimeter of material at a time. Uh, and on a machine like a Shape Oco that's not very rigid, you, you can't get too aggressive. Uh, otherwise, tool deflection is going to get crazy. So what I've done is set a one millimeter step over on roughing passes, and then I've just kind of arbitrarily set the number of step overs at eight. I chose this number just because it's safely higher than I would ever need. Um, it's not actually doing eight step overs. It's, I think it's doing like 
three or four. Uh, in okay, so that's a little bit diff different than I thought it was. Uh, okay, so that's that's the coming in from the side, the number of steps. On multiple depths, that's where I've how how I said how far it goes in at a or down at a time. I thought this was set at 0.5, but apparently it's 0.8, uh, which means it's never going to go down more than 0.8 millimeters. Uh, and then the last the last pass, it's going to go down 0.2. Uh, this was probably unnecessary considering uh, the bottom of this profile is not part of is not part of the finished part uh but um oh well and then uh stock to leave i've set at 0.1 millimeters uh that's the amount oversized it is um and once again i'm going to come in with my second operation and get rid of that 0.1 uh millimeters uh a tiny bit at a time but for now i'm going to leave it 0.1 millimeters oversized, and that's 0.1 millimeters oversized radial, radially. Uh, so the the overall overall it's 0.2 millimeters oversized, and then feed optimization simply slows down uh, the machine when you're getting into tight corners. So for example, here we see these kind of tight radius bends. Uh, it's going to slow that down. Uh, as it's engaging with more material so it doesn't overload itself. Now one advantage of this um, this method that I'm using here is the outsides, it's doing all the machining from the outsides and the outsides are clear. So chip evacuation is takes care of itself. Okay, so now Hold on real quick, I'm gonna check chat, see if we have any questions. So, uh, yes, uh, Juan, well, yes and no. Juan asks if this is uh, something for the subcontrabassoon. So, what I'm making now is a shaper for a crumb horn, but I use that same process to make a subcontrabassoon shaper. Uh, once again, I just, I wanted more shapers uh, to get anodized at the same time, so I wasn't wasting as much money on uh, minimums, on anodizing minimums. Okay. And see, so okay, so here we can get a better view of, we're doing uh, five passes to cut the side profiles and I I don't know how many how many I don't know something like 20 I guess it's probably like 24 because it's 19 millimeters uh, 0.8 millimeters at a time and then the second process Uh, once again, this this should be twelve thousand, not fifteen thousand. I used uh, fifteen thousand RPM for the ball nose cutter. Uh, that's be I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> uh, and the overall setup is pretty similar, except there's a few key differences. Multiple depths is turned off. So it's just going to go all the way down to the bottom of the profile and cut. It's not going to go down in 0.8 millimeter increments. Uh, stock to leave is changed to zero. So it's going to go down to um, as small as it's um, supposed to be. Now, in the finishing process, as I kind of smooth these side profiles with... Uh, uh, with um, with a vertical with a vertical sanding barrel, um, I'm going to remove a little bit of that, but the anodizing process also thickens it a little bit, so it's going to cancel each other out roughly. 
Um, if I wasn't going to anodize it, I would probably leave a little bit of extra material on the side profile to remove it, uh, to, to, so that when I sand it down smooth, it's still over, or it's the right size. Um, and then roughing passes, instead of one millimeter, so when I was removing the bulk material, I was removing one millimeter at a time, but only 0.8 millimeters deep. Now I'm removing 0.025 millimeters, the minimum uh, resolution of my machine, um, just kind of doing skim passes or spring passes to, to very uh, gradually bring it into final size. Okay. Let's see if we have any more questions. So Juan asks, uh, when do I start to launch the sub contra bassoon? Uh, so I'm, it's going to take as long as it takes. Um, there are some pieces I look forward to playing when it's, when it's ready to go, when the prototype is, uh, ready. But, um, for now I'm focusing on finishing it. Uh, will one also ask if I'm going to play it in the orchestra? Um, I'd love to. Uh, so that's playing it in the orchestra is a pretty big ask because what you'd essentially be, uh, one of my orchestras would essentially need to commission a new work, pay a new composer to write a sub contra bassoon part, um, and, or to write a piece that includes a sub contra bassoon part. And so like in a normal commission, you might be able to bring down the cost per orchestra by spreading it out, by getting different or uh, multiple orchestras involved in a consortium. But for this, since I'd be the only one that could play it, it would essentially be my orchestra footing the entire bill for the commission. And that's a pretty big ask. What I do think is more likely that I'm going to have a better chance of, you know, begging my orchestras to do is programming a chamber concert something that involves, you know, like six or eight people that includes the sub contra bassoon. Uh, not only is that, you know, a much easier financial burden for an orchestra to bear, um, it would also be a better, uh, the audience would be better able to see the sub contra bassoon and hear the sub contra bassoon because they'd be up close in a smaller area with a smaller ensemble as opposed to, you know, buried in 80 other people on stage. So uh, real quick, let's let's take a look at the. So I mentioned before that I already did the machining process on these arcs. Let's take a closer look at that. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here is the bottom arc. Uh, actually, I need to regenerate these. Hold on. Okay. So, the... Uh, yeah, I'll just simulate that. So, I needed two different tools here. One tool to remove the bulk of the stock and I used my uh, quarter inch flat end mill. 
and then another tool to remove the um, or to uh, clean up the shape because a flat end mill is going to leave a stair step pattern and I want a kind of a smooth arc so I needed to come in and finish it with a ball nose end mill. So first of all, it's going to bring it down to overall height. And then Okay. So now we have once again this kind of stair-stepped arc. And then I switched tools to a quarter inch ball nose end mill. And it's going to go in, since it has a curve, since the cutter itself is curved, it's much better able to do these, um, do these nice uh, smooth curves. And then we get something that looks like that. Now, I still needed to do a little bit of sanding to, to smooth it up. Once again, this is not a perfectly rigid machine, um, but it, it worked. And so far I've made six of them in different sizes. The, um, for the bassoon sized shapers, the 120 millimeter shapers, I'm doing a radius of 28 millimeters. For contrabassoon, the 150 millimeter shapers, I'm doing a radius of 32 millimeters. And then for the subcontrabassoon, 180 millimeter shaper, I'm doing a, a radius of 35 millimeters. All right, so that was the bottom. Now let's go in to the top. Top is a little more complicated. Regenerate these. Actually, hold on. Forgot that I had all of these suppressed. Okay. So for the uh, the top arc, the uh, the concave arc, uh, I didn't start. I, instead of starting with the quarter inch end mill, I actually started with an eighth inch flat end mill. Uh, this is because the smaller diameter made it better able to get inside this machine. It could get to arcs or get to parts that the quarter inch end mill wouldn't have been able to. It does mean that it took a little bit longer, but for me it was worth it not to have to change uh, bits from quarter inch to eighth inch. Or sorry, from yeah, from quarter inch to eighth inch. And I wanted I wanted to remove as much material as possible with the flat end mills because the ball nose end mills um, they're they're not really good for removing a lot of material. Um, if you imagine, so when we talk about setting speeds and feeds, that's all dependent on knowing at what speed this outside edge of the cutter is moving when it's spinning. On a ball nose end mill, that is not constant because the radius is different. So the speed that the cutter is moving up here is, you know, like 15,000 RPM, whatever you've set it to, but the speed that you're moving at this very tip is essentially nothing. Um, so you want to move, remove as much stock as possible with the uh, flat end mills. So let's... Go back here. Oh, hold on. This is not going to be right. Simulate this.
and then same idea as before using the ball nose to clean everything up and get it as smooth as possible now there's one extra step I had here on the top part the concave part that I didn't have on the bottom part and that is um, there are these pockets here and these are if I can take one apart real quick Looks like we're actually getting pretty close to the end. I might go check on it in a second. But if we look at this top piece, we'll see that there are these little pockets here and those are those are to retain these springs. The springs uh, make it a lot easier to use. So yeah, once again, I'm gonna go check that and I'll be back in a second. Okay, so uh, we are getting close to the end. So right now it's finished removing most of the material and it's doing those skim passes on the outside to clean everything up. And then from there, there's only a few steps left. Uh, so if you look here closely, I've engraved a little logo uh, I've engraved the label. So this is CRS0. This is a Soprano Crumhorn Shaper Revision 0. And then I've also engraved these little cut lines that will help me uh, cut off these block, excuse me, cut off these blocks where I want them. Uh, and in order to do that, I need this. I'm going to be switching to a different tool. Uh, I have an engraving bit. So I'm going to need to switch tools and then re indicate that uh, to, to, to reset my zero. Uh, this time, instead of having the zero at the bottom, I'm going to set the zero at the, the top surface. And we can take a look at what's going to go on here. Okay. Okay. So 
So once again, we're using a different cutter. So this is going to be engraving those cut lines on the sides. And then the logo. And then the name. Well, that's the, well, okay. It's running all of them. But uh, you get the idea. And then once I do that, I'll be, I'll be ready to unbolt it from the work fixture and move on to the Sopranino crumb horn. Uh, now I'm not gonna live stream both uh, shapers. Figure one is enough. So let's see, any, uh, any more questions while we're waiting for this to finish up? Let's see. So uh, uh, Jared mentioned that you can anodize yourself with, uh, at, at home with various chemicals. Uh, I've looked into it and I'll be honest, I'm, I'd rather just pay someone to do it. Because <laughs> uh, it's not just the, um, it's not just an anodizing, then you have to, it's not just getting the chemicals, it's uh, properly disposing of the chemicals. And um, yeah, I, that, that's something I'd rather not deal with. Um, Okay, so I've gone over, uh, I guess I can real quick take a look at the uh, speeds and feeds. Oh, okay. So our, uh, this side profile is done which means it's time for me to go in the garage and um, change tools and do the, uh, the etching on the surface. Okay, the horrible sound is gone is stopped. Uh, and then now to start another horrible sound, I'm going to turn on the vacuum, uh, the shop vac, clean up some of these uh, uh, chips. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I was worried that this piece right here might mean that something had gone wrong and been torn out, but that doesn't look like it was the case. Everything feels right. Okay.
obvious. I'm a wimp. I use a clamp to undo these because these wrenches are about the least ergonomic things ever made. And it was hurting my hands. But I am not too proud to admit that. Okay, so here is my engraving bit that I'm going to be using for these next steps. See if we can get a better look. Yeah, that was after some fancy camera work. Okay. Graver in there. Okay. So if I were to do nothing, if I were to just try to run it, it would try to engrave what I want it to engrave, but it would try to engrave it on the surface of this bottom plate instead of the surface of the material, uh, which would essentially break everything. Um, so what I need to do is reset or re-zero my z-axis on the top of the machine, or on the top of the material. Okay, z-zero, x-zero, y-zero. Nope, that goes. with the logo. Uh, let's see if I can get a good view. Well, I might just have to hold this to get a good view. Sorry about that. Uh, so for the, engra for the engraving bit, I'm going to go quite a bit faster at something like 24,000 RPMs um, because, once again, that, that, um, the, since the, point is so, the, the cutting point is so small, you need to run it faster so that the surface speed is enough to cut. Okay. Get ready for horrible sounds.
forgot to prepare my G code for the label for the Alto. So doing that real quick.
Okay. So now we're ready to remove this. And I'm going to run this back into the, uh, the other room so you all can maybe get a better look at it. But Okay. And here we are. We've taken this and turned it into this. So, let's. So, I'm going to separate these two halves. So, right now the springs aren't in there, so they're a little bit finicky to separate. But once the springs are in there, they'll come, come apart very nicely. So we have the two halves. I'm going to install those springs in these pockets. our knobs And now we have a mostly complete Alto Crumhorn Shaper. So the few things I'm going to do after, next, or I'm not going to do on this stream, uh, but afterwards, um, I, you might notice that there's no V-groove on the edges. Normally you like to have a V-groove on the edge of the shaper. That way you, you can cut a notch that gives you a fold point. And on the soon shaper, you can see that I do have a V groove, but I kind of I kind of messed up in that I machined the V groove first, and then did the sanding on the outside, and as a result, the it rounded over the corners on this V groove. When what I really want is nice sharp corners. So what I'm going to do is do my sand my sanding, polishing, and cleaning now, and then once uh, it looks essentially perfect. The last thing I'm going to do is machine that V groove in so it's as uh, sharp as possible. I'm also going to go in and cut off these blocks on the end that hold it in place. And I'm also going to come in with a cutting, uh, with a deburr wheel and deburr all these edges so it feels nice and comfortable in the hands. Right now, these edges are pretty razor sharp, so you wouldn't want to use this. But there we go. Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this bizarre stream uh, as we shaping a shaper on a shape oko. Um, if you have any last minute questions, now's the time. Otherwise, I'll be ending here in a, a few few minutes. Here's our soprano, alto, and tenor crumb horn shapers.
So Dave Brooke asks what materials the keys are made out of. Uh, so the keys, so if you weren't here for that part of the stream, the reason I bought a Shape Oko was to make uh, Subcontra Bassoon key work. Uh, these, these are made out of nickel silver, uh, which is uh, essentially an alloy of brass, but with, uh, with more nickel, so it's harder. Uh, the big advantage there is it's stiffer, it's harder to bend, uh, so the key work will be a little more robust. Uh, the downside is it's harder to machine. Uh, the spe specifically, I used what's called C752. Uh, that's the specific alloy of nickel silver I used. Um, it's about 60% copper, 20% nickel, 20% zinc. Uh, Jeremy Johnson asks, what are my plans for the bocal? Uh, so the bocal... Um, I need to, so I'm going to be making a mandrel and then uh, using that to make a the vocal out of nickel silver and then uh, brazing that together. So brazing, this, so essentially cutting out a cone of nickel silver, wrapping it around a mandrel, brazing it together, and then uh, running it through a draw bench. So right now I need to make the vocal mandrel. Uh, and I need to make a draw bench because um, I don't need a draw bench just for the vocal. I also need uh, I need it for the tubes. So the um, so after the vocal, there's a descending tube, and then there's three ascending tubes before you get to the main body joints. So I need to make all of those. I've already made the mandrels for the tubes, just not for the vocal. Um, and um, and I've already cut out the material. I already have the cones of nickel silver sheet stock cut out. Um, and um, yeah, it's, vocals are complicated. Um, oh, and then the final step is, um, so there's a special alloy. There, there are a couple of options for what, if you try to just take a thin walled tube that's straight, and bend it into shape, it's going to crumple and collapse. So you need to fill it with something. Traditionally, this would have been wet sand. You pack it full of wet sand and then you bend it. Uh, these days, though, what's normally used is a, a special alloy of a metal that has a melting temperature below the boiling point of water. Uh, something like Cerobend, or uh, Cerobend is what I'm using. Um, and Essentially, you put it in boiling water, you melt the metal, then you pour that in the bocal. Since it's so cold, or it's nowhere near hot enough to mess with solder or the the metal itself, then you plunge that into cold water so it solidifies quickly. Then you can bend it, and it's solid on the inside. And then when, once you've gotten it in the shape you want, you put it back in boiling water and you melt out all of that, uh, that alloy. Um, and that, that's my plan. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there'll be extra challenges along the way. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call it a stream. Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this. Um, once again, I have some some videos in the pipeline talk going in more depth about the uh, the key work but since this wasn't a an actual part of the subcontra bassoon project just a, a weird little uh, side quest I thought this might be a good opportunity for a stream all right well uh, everybody stay safe have a good day and I will uh, see you all